My friend, thank you so much for joining me today. I should know this. I think it's your fifth appearance on the podcast. I think it keeps you in the lead. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here for fifth and hopefully I'll keep appearing for 50th time at some point. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm not letting you get away that easily. <laughs> Listen, when I saw that you were writing about Microsoft, I immediately thought this is a good one to talk about. It's going to be great. And then when I actually read what you wrote, wow, it's even better than I expected because it's a very complex company. 40 years of history. It's basically like got a finger in every pie everywhere. It's doing a bit of everything. So it's very, very hard to try to analyze and summarize. But I think you did a great job. And I think it's going to be lots of fun to talk about. How did you find the research? How do you find writing it? Microsoft is, unfortunately, the most favorite company that I don't own. <laughs> <laughs> That's my biggest takeaway after doing the deep dive. Like, obviously, I think this is just not me, but also for most people, I, I noticed that when it comes to big tech companies, almost everyone thinks they understand these businesses. Like, yes, I understand Facebook. Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, like what's not to understand? And I think that definitely creates a false sense of confidence and a misperception of understanding what it actually means to understand a business. Studying Microsoft, I'm not claiming that I understand all the nitty gritty details of this business. This is a $2 trillion business and I have only spent carefully a month to study this business. So there's definitely a lot to explore and uncover, but it definitely made me reflective and made me think of some of the other big tech companies and their evolution and the historical parables that I at times noticed. There's a lot of similarities that I felt Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates had. That's great. No, let's start with something controversial. That's the way <laughs> to get people going. I'm curious. What are some of the similarities that you're seeing between Zuckerberg and Bill Gates? I have like a few points in mind. So first of all, let's start with something a bit frivolous. Bill Gates had, I think, two sisters and Zuckerberg had three sisters, no brothers. They both went to private school and they both you know, started tinkering with entrepreneurship or with business ideas with technology when they were in high school. They both went to Harvard. They both dropped out of Harvard. They both started their company at the age of 19. Not saying like, there's much to gain insight from this random bunch of information. It's just interesting. I think I personally, when I first studied Facebook or what is currently known as Meta, Meta Platforms, I was struck by the fact that a 19-year-old guy started something. And again, like when you start kind of a revolutionary product, think about it. Google came after Facebook with all its might and power and resources. They came after, they went after a company that was started by a 19-year-old guy. And similar to Bill Gates, it was a, not a top secret mission that a PC revolution is happening or going to happen. A lot of people understood that, but it was a 19-year-old boy who basically truly capitalized on that PC revolution in a way that probably you know, boggles almost everyone's mind. That's kind of historical parables. Again, like not much to probably gain insight. The other thing that I noticed, and this is where I probably I'll go into the bit of the weeds, there are similarities in personality. The way they dealt with their co-founders, <laughs> for example. Famously, yeah. Yes. So Paul Allen, for example, he was with Bill Gates. It was a partnership. It was a 50-50 partnership. Then Bill Gates came up with something called like, you know, 4060, 60 for Bill Gates, 40 for Paul Allen, because Allen was drawing salaries from Microsoft for some of the services they were providing to a company. And Bill was writing codes, but he wasn't really drawing salaries. And at some point say, hey, I actually didn't take any money, but I actually had enormous input for our company. So I think from now on, I want to take 60%, you have 40%. And it's just two people's, two guys' company. So yeah, sure. He wasn't super happy, but he understood Bill's point. And the value of keeping Bill around. You don't want to <laughs> chase him away. Exactly. And then after a while, Gates had some other like you know, big deals that he managed to gain. And he's like, you know what? It shouldn't be 60-40. It should be 
6436 because I am making incremental contribution and that needs to be fairly incorporated in our partnership. Again, he wasn't super happy. Alan wasn't super happy about it, and but he understood the point. He understood the rationale and he's like, okay, 6436. And then I want to read this passage from Paul Allen's memoir. Here's what he said. Paul Allen actually was diagnosed with early stage cancer in his late 20s. So he was kind of dealing with that. And as he was dealing with that, this is what he mentioned. One evening in late December 1982, I heard Bill and Steve, Steve as in Steve Ballmer, Steve speaking heatedly in Bill's office and paused outside to listen in. It was easy to get the gist of the conversation. They were bemoaning my recent lack of production and discussion how they might dilute my Microsoft equity by issuing options to themselves and other shareholders. If you watched the Social Network movie, you probably know how Zuckerberg also diluted Eduardo de Saverin. Although I, I would argue Zuckerberg had much better reasons to do that. Eduardo de Saverin was working for another startup. He wasn't really a huge believer of Facebook that we know. He was working for another startup and he was supposed to look after the business side of Facebook, the startup, but he didn't fully buy what Zuckerberg was doing, how he was envisioning the product may evolve. This is about Microsoft, so I don't want to get into the <laughs> details too much about what Zuckerberg did, but it's kind of a similar thing. He did issue sh- options to dilute Edward the Sovereign's shares. And- There's echoes of that everywhere. Some of these founders are so obsessed and ruthless about winning that they'll never be equal partners with anyone. Think of the Steves at Apple. Wozniak was great technically, and he was indispensable at first. But when he wasn't, well, Steve Jobs wasn't an equal partner. (laughs) You just didn't see that way. So I totally see these parallels. I do want to mention this, another paragraph from his memoir, which I thought was interesting, and you probably see why. Microsoft in 1979, so Microsoft was started in 1975. So this is 1979, and they did $2 million of revenue four years after starting the company. And they did $8 million of revenue in 1981. Apparently, Paul Allen had a huge contribution to that. And this is what he said. Under the circumstances, I felt that our 6436 partnership split was out of whack. Bill had set a precedent by claiming extra equity for his work on Altair Basic, another exceptional contribution. Now is time, I thought, to augment my share. A modest adjustment in the ratio seemed only right. But when I made my case, Bill would have none of it. This is what Bill said. I don't ever want you to talk about this again. Do not bring it up. In that moment, something died for me. I thought that our partnership was based on fairness, but I now saw that Bill's self-interest overrode all other considerations. My partner was out to grab as much of the pie as possible and hold on to it. And that was something I could not accept. I didn't have it out with Bill at that time. I sucked it up and thought, okay, but one day I'm out of here. And he was out of Microsoft in 1983, before the IPO. So again, a lot of similarities, how some of the details had played out with Facebook as well. If we talk about more quantitative metrics, just five years after Microsoft was started in 1975, Microsoft was profitable. It had like 20% operating margin. Facebook at year five was, had like 30% operating margin. A pretty far cry from what we see these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I guess I don't want to belittle too much on what today's companies are doing. I think the more and more I study these companies, I think I only start appreciating more how big of an anomaly today's big tech companies were and are, still are. This is the nature of capitalism. It's not like, you know, you have an idea and you just start a company and you become incredibly profitable and growing at like 30, 40, 50% with no stop in sight. That doesn't happen. That's not normal. The what we are seeing, the companies are competing with each other for talent, for incremental pies. 
that's probably you know standard capitalism. What Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon did and do are anomalies. We should not look at these companies and say, hey, where's my 30% profit margin <laughs> in year five? You have been operating for like 10 years or 15 years. Where's my profits? That was also one of the takeaways for me that these are just anomalous companies. If anyone says this is the next Facebook, then only then I'll probably look at their financial statements. and It's like, yeah, I know what the actual Facebook looked like in their financials. What's your financials look like if you are claiming you are the next Facebook? And if it doesn't resemble anywhere close to what actual Facebook was, then they're being a phony. The burden of proof is very high. In your deep dive, you show the financials from 1982, basically to now, but I have a screenshot up to 1999 and it's incredible, right? They were growing a hundred percent in 83, 95% in 84. And then the rest of the year is like all above 30, 40%. But the EBIT margin is all above 20 and then above 30. And it goes all the way to 50% EBIT margin in 1999. That kind of hyper growth at hyper profit, you basically never see that for that long, right? For decades after decades. I thought a parallel that you were going to make between Bill Gates and Zuckerberg was that the perception is also kind of similar if you adjust for the time periods, because Bill Gates today is perceived a certain way. But back in the 80s and the 90s, it was very, very different. And in the same way that Zuckerberg and Facebook built something remarkable, but they don't get much respect for it. As I grew up, Bill Gates and Microsoft were like the Borg. People love to hate the company and ascribe all kinds of things to them and everything was terrible and they didn't deserve any of their success. They were just a monopoly and yeah. <laughs> all the things that were kind of said about Microsoft and Gates at the time are some of the same things that are said about Zuckerberg and Facebook and Meta these days. So that's another parallel. I was probably going to mention that. That's definitely true. I guess the point that I want to mention the most is the parallel that I perceived about the information superhighway and the metaverse. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I had some interesting takeaways just by following what happened to information superhighways. Maybe for younger listeners, yeah, we could summarize kind of what it is. Maybe I'll give it a try and let me know if I'm missing something. But for a while in the early 90s, even John Malone, all people were like, the future is the information superhighway. Then you saw ads on TV with like flying cars that kind of became beams of lights and it all convert together. And that thing was like, you were going to get most of this information probably kind of through your TV or some kind of consoles, or it's all going to come together yeah. and you're going to access this. You're going to have 500 channels on your TV of interactive TV stuff. That was kind of the vision before the web exploded and the open standards and nobody controlled it. But before then, all of these companies, like that's why Microsoft invested in TV companies and like MSNBC and all that. They thought that it would be a merger of tech companies and old telecommunications. Is that kind of a good summary? Yes, absolutely. A lot of people these days, I have noticed, they said, hey, yeah, Bill Gates was right. Internet is an information superhighway. But if you actually read closely what he actually meant, there are material differences. So what Bill Gates said, like, and I think if I just you know, give you probably a couple of quotes, people will probably appreciate how off he was from the actual internet. So he said, today's internet is not the information highway I imagine. Although you can think of it as the beginning of the highway, the information highway Bill Gates basically envisioned again, his words, would be different from the internet as the Oregon Trail was to Interstate 84. Now, I had to Google this up. I couldn't quite understand promptly what this means, the Oregon Trail to Interstate 84. So for the listeners who are like me, who don't quite understand what this is, the Oregon Trail was a history trail that was used by the pioneers to travel from the Midwest to the West Coast of the United States from the 1840s to the 1860s. Famously deadly and difficult. Yes, deadly and difficult. And Interstate 84 is like a modern interstate highway that was constructed in the 1950s and 60s. And who knows? Bill Gates may be right. <laughs> and just 40 years later. <laughs> just 40 years later. So that's always the thing. And it's possible Zuckerberg's metaverse could be like that. This is one of the things that I probably want to highlight when it comes to the information superhighway and metaverse parallels. Gates was convinced that information superhighway is a real thing, and it's coming. It's coming way sooner than it may never come, but he definitely thinks it's going to be a thing by... Yeah, he thought it would be 98 or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
And he actually, with a couple of Microsoft executives, he wrote a book called The Road Ahead. In that book, he basically outlined how the information superhighway will be revolutionary and all that. And in that book, he just briefly mentioned the internet. It's just the Oregon Trail. So just a few months after he actually finished the book and published the book, he realized he got it wrong. Internet is a huge thing. It's a huge deal. And he actually rewrote many parts of the book. And he added like 20,000 words extra to highlight the significance of internet. Which deserves a lot of credit because being wrong is like everybody's wrong all the time. But most people don't realize it quickly and pivot away. The internet tidal wave memo that is super famous at Microsoft, it's not a failure. It's turning a mistake into a win because the other companies around Microsoft, they probably made the same mistake that Microsoft was making, but they didn't pivot as quickly and as fast. Yeah, and you also mentioned somewhere else in the deep dive how everybody thinks of Gates as like, oh yeah, he was super nerdy, he was a, a colder a geek and everything, and that's kind of his superpower. But the way he did the sales, the salesmanship and the strategy are undervalued assets that Microsoft had. And the way that he kind of had this vision of the future that probably the others were all focused like on the next quarter, can we build these things? And he was like, okay, like the PCs are coming, the software is gonna be its own thing. And he saw it and he could build for that. And I think the same thing happened later with this internet wave where he got it wrong at first, but he was still always looking at the horizon and then he saw it coming and then he could switch to it. Kind of like Facebook did with mobile. They were a desktop app for such a long time. They grew up in it. That was the company's DNA. And they were kind of getting killed by mobile for a while, but then they were able to pivot. So that's another parallel. I don't know if we're going to be able to keep making parallels with Facebook, but that's another one. Just to finish my thought on the metaverse parallel, I think I have been a shareholder of Meta for a while, for I think almost five years now. And it has been at times painful experience to be a shareholder of Meta. During the dark days of October 2022. <laughs> right? Bad old days, long ago. <laughs> right. During the pretty dark days of October 22. That is the question I basically asked myself. The bet is simple. It's not what's the next quarter's earnings, what's the advertising growth or recession and all that. That's not what we're talking about when it comes to meta. The bet is simple. Is Zuckerberg going to be continue to be wrong? for years and years? Or is he going to learn from his mistake? I think which one is more likely? Zuckerberg is not a stranger. He's been around. We know his history. He has a track record. And... He has a track record. He's not some stranger in the tech world. We know what he did from 2004 to 2021. In 17 years, Facebook or Meta, in 17 years, they, they reached $95 billion gross profit and $45 billion operating profit in 17 years. Microsoft took almost 40 years, 44 years. Apple took 45 years, something like that. So it's not just, it's just, you know, built a business and like unprofitable. He knows that profitable growth is what you need to build to be able to attract talent, to be able to compete with other big tech companies. And he doesn't have Amazon's relentless reinvestment opportunities. The question was, to me, was very simple. Was Zuckerberg going to be wrong consistently for years and years? It's not just a year thing or a quarter thing. He's just going to be wrong for years and years. He's waiting on information highway, and he's never going to get off that. Now, it doesn't mean I'm saying he's going to shut down metaverse. I also think, if you look at like information highway, Bill Gates was right in many ways. But he was also wrong in some very important details. It's not binary. It's not all one or it's the other. Binary. You can adjust and you can take some of what you already did on one side and put it on the other. Zuckerberg can be spectacularly wrong about some of the specifics he mentioned. And he can still be right in details in a way that allows him to pivot certain things that he's trying to do in meta, like in, in reality lab segment. Just a small example. Meta Horizon Worlds, one of the probably biggest complaints is there are too many kids in that, in that app, but actually there's not supposed to be kids on that app. So if you think about it, we don't quite know yet whether there's a generational gap in the sense, maybe it's something that the millennials will never get attracted to. Maybe we'll never be able to understand why we would want to be a cartoon or like a digital avatar. Obviously, it's not probably going to be cartoon for forever. There will be probably a very human-like an avatar 
in these apps, we may never see the point of it. Or maybe only a few of us will. It's like Snapchat or TikTok or some apps begin with some generations and Could be. boomers may never go on Snapchat. But for a company like Meta, they want to be the social glue for every generation. That is a reinvestment opportunity. Zuckerberg cannot go to a retail business. He tried, but... <laughs> Their shopping business is not working for some reason. <laughs> so that's the thing. Information superhighway and metaverse, both of them can potentially be wrong in spectacular ways. But the details within those grand ambitions, like these people like Gates, Musk, Bezos, Jobs, Zuckerberg, my understanding is it is not accident what they have built. None of the companies that they have today are by accident. It's not like lottery. A company has to survive and be durable and, and grow profitably for years and years and years for decades. It's not like you just win a lottery and that's it. These people are almost never wrong in every detail. And also, even if they are wrong in some ways spectacularly, they do not dwell there for forever. It would be surprising. So my basically conclusion was during the dark days of October, it is a very low probability event. Nothing is impossible, of course, but it is a very low probability event that Zuckerberg will continue to be wrong in spectacular ways and in also all the minute details of where things are going, where the human species is going and how our social evolution, the evolution of social interaction will play out. I thought that was a very low probability event. Like how come you have 3 billion people on your platform, you understand, you have the data points of all the, like how people interact and what people want and be completely off and wrong about what the next generation is wants to do, what we'll try to do. I still think it's a low probability. I have used Meta's products, like the headset. I do sense interesting aspects that I think may potentially be interesting in ways that we are not thinking today. We can't really predict all the intricate details and nuances of internet sitting in 1994, 1995. Another parallel that may be interesting, actually two other parallels, is how Microsoft missed the mobile wave and other companies were the one to build it. Even if they were trying, like they've been trying on mobile for, I don't know, 10 years maybe before that. They were trying to make all kinds of tablets long before the iPads. They had Windows CE and all kinds of Windows mobile products. They were partnering with Nokia and others, even with all that investment, happened. it wasn't them that kind of got it. That's one parallel. And another one I'm curious your opinion about, because you wrote about it in the deep dive, is all of the antitrust that Microsoft went through, we are kind of seeing some of that starting to happen with all of the big tech today. And I always forget, every time I see that Bill Gates stepped down as CEO in 2000, it feels weird, because to me, he's been around Microsoft for so long, but... I can't help but wonder if Gates had stayed CEO for longer, if Balmer didn't have as long a run. I think it's pretty non-controversial to say that things would have been better with Gates than with Balmer. My question is, how much better? Did Balmer do most of what Gates would have done anyway, and Gates was still around and a chairman and advising anyway, so maybe there wouldn't have been that much difference. But I can't help but wonder, like, as big and dominant as Microsoft is today, maybe it could be even more so if Gates had stayed around longer. I definitely pray and hope. I think what Bill Gates was probably in his early 40s when he left the CEO role. And I definitely pray and hope that Zuckerberg is not going to step down in a couple of years well, or something like that. He's 39. So many founders have been leaving in recent times. I know. So it could happen. I don't rule out that possibility. It's a very, very tough job. And like you said, you know, it's probably not fun to be hated by so many people in many cases for completely unfair reasons. There are lots of legitimate reasons to be angry at Facebook. I'm not saying that there is no legitimate reason. There are a lot of legitimate reasons. But as a shareholder, I obviously am aware of a lot of critics. And at times I definitely feel that many times critics are actually not serious about reaching the other side. They're just trying to preach to the choir. They're not really interested in, let's say, talking to people or convincing people who may not be convinced about all the ills that they only see about social media or the company in, in particular. But your question about Bill Gates' resignation or the fact that he left so early, an interesting thing that I noticed, I guess another parallel, Bill Gates has three kids, 
So does Zuckerberg. He just has another kid. I think Bill Gates has like two daughters and one son. And Zuckerberg has three daughters. Bill Gates, I think his first kid was born in 1996. I actually just looked these things up. I kind of went deep into this. I do think Zuckerberg wasn't at his best in, let's say, last couple of years or so. And when I look back, if you think about both Gates and Zuckerberg individually, it's a lot. It's not a small company. Both Gates and Zuckerberg in their mid-30s had quote-unquote monopolies in hand. Everybody agrees that these are monopolies and they need to be controlled. They need to be regulated. Everybody is kind of in consensus. They're in their mid-30s and they're starting their family. Like even for normal people like you and me, when you are doing low stress jobs, not so consequential jobs where everybody knows what we are doing and everybody's coming after us. And even when we try to start family, it feels like there's a lot on our plate. And think about these individuals. These are extremely resourceful people. They have probably hundreds of people helping, trying to help and all that. But still, like psychologically, I do think there are parallels. Those few years, probably a lot of stressful years for both these guys. They were just starting their families, their kids were born, and they're both running extremely profitable, extremely powerful global companies with all the complexity that comes with it. And they also were facing competition. As FTC was basically trying to gun them for monopolies all that, in reality, probably for the first time, they were facing actual competition. Like for Meta, it's TikTok. For Microsoft, it's Netscape. I think last few years, there are also some parables that what Gates faced and Zuckerberg. And that's why, you know, as I was kind of going through Gates' life around the time, I become a little concerned <laughs> whether Zuckerberg would survive in the next few years. So we'll see how that goes. The psychological aspect, not to be the armchair pop psychologist here, but the psychological aspects of almost every time you turn on the TV, you read something online, you go on social media, and like everybody's as pitchforks and torches out for you, it must not be easy. And sometimes you must want to just, I've done what I could, let somebody else take the blame. He could say, I'll stay as the chairman. So I'll have the control. Like, like it, he can basically do what the Google guys did. Yeah, they kind of like disappeared from the map of the radar. They must be paying people to keep them out of the news because I hear so little <laughs> about them, I kind of forget they exist. That's another question, I guess. But back to Microsoft, that's another interesting thing to look at. Balmer's tenure and then Nadella's tenure. And I think you point out something excellent that people forget. They love to blame Balmer for everything, right? It's like, it wasn't Balmer's fault that the market was ready to pay such high multiples when he came in. And the exact inverse kind of happened to Nadella for probably good reasons, because Microsoft kind of fumbling all the opportunities and wasting basically a lot of capital and bad acquisitions. And the market was like, okay, this company is slowly losing relevance and wasting all its money. So it's compress and compress and compress the multiple. Nadella came in at just that time, perfect time to ride all kinds of different waves, undoing a lot of mistakes at the same time as like multiple expansions, at the same time as riding the cloud wave and all of that. So I'm curious if you have some thoughts about these 10 years post Gates. You're absolutely right. I think it wasn't Balmer's fault. Investors are basically paying 30 times revenue of Microsoft. And Microsoft was the largest company in the world. It's not like some mid-cap companies that people would imagine. I think you mentioned 12 years after IPO in 1998, they became the largest company in the world. 12 largest years. in the world. That's insane, yeah. right? In 12 <laughs> years, you go from, let's IPO, guys, and then you're the biggest company in the world. Yes. When Balmer became CEO, their market cap was like $550, $600 billion. $600 billion, I think. And by the time he resigned in 2014, the market cap was like $250 billion. It's definitely 14 years and $350 billion market cap. I think much of the blame probably is on the investor side. And this is something I notice even in this cycle. There's so many angry investors these days. These companies didn't ask you to pay for 80 times. They don't have times. control over that. Because if you look at the... You did. Numbers, like I'm looking at... We did. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the chart. So when Balmer came in, total revenue for Microsoft was about 23 billion. And when he left, it was almost 87 billion. Growth was pretty nice. And the margin compressed. They had a bunch of new challenges and they did some stupid stuff, but it was still over 30% EBIT margins. Operationally, the business looked like it was doing well, but the starting point matters a lot to perception. If Balmer had came in at, I don't know, five times revenue the story could have been very, very different. That's always a possibility. But, and I did 
mention this. When I say those things, I do not want to underscore or underappreciate Nadella's contribution, like what he did. I was actually reading something yesterday where someone mentioned that I think Microsoft gained something like $500 billion market cap from the lows this year. That's insane. <laughs> so Nadella came in at like $250 billion market cap and basically the company gained $500 billion market cap in the last, I guess, four months or something like that. Yeah, and then just right? to put so. context, I'm defending Balmer as someone who doesn't like Balmer. He's not my kind of executive at all. It's almost like Microsoft is such a good business that even Balmer couldn't screw it up totally. That's kind of how I look at it. And maybe that's unfair, but I think Balmer was kind of like a financials operations guy and he was good at that. But I think on the strategic level, he didn't have it. He didn't have the vision. He made all the big mistakes. A lot of Balmer's mistakes are sins of omissions. So you don't see it because it's something he didn't do, but he had all of the pieces to do it. And if he had, maybe Microsoft could be a player in the mobile space. Maybe undo a few of these acquisitions and instead do a couple of good acquisitions. And you could have gigantic other branches to the tree right now, but it's all counterfactual. So who knows? That's a very good point. And that reminds me of another historical parables between IBM and Microsoft. Old school. Old school. And this is something... That also made me very reflective. So Lou Gerstner, when he became IBM CEO, he mentioned, like he later wrote about this. He said, if you went back and see what are the businesses we were in, in 1990, I'm talking about IBM, and what are the businesses IBM was in in 2000, he said, we were in the same business, but we adapted to the realities of the market. I'm not an expert on IBM, so I don't know what he's talking about. I just read about what he was writing. So he was. He mentioned like the business model shift that IBM went through from 1990 to 2000 was the reason they thrived under his leadership and thrived in the 90s. So it's not like they found a new piece of the puzzle. There was no missing piece. They had everything. They just adapted in a way that made sense in the market. Similar to Balmer, he's the one who started you know, Azure. Or even like the subscription model and all that. The pieces were there. They just didn't use them well. The pieces were there, but he was so focused on protecting Windows. He was a very Windows-driven guy. Windows was the bread and butter and everything has to revolve around Windows. So the pieces were there, but he just couldn't organize it. I think Azure was called Windows Azure for a while. And that was so confusing to me. I had no idea what that service was for back then because cloud wasn't as well known as today. And they were marketing it so poorly and it never felt like a real AWS competitors until Nadella put his stamp on it. The other thing is, although it's kind of a fluffy thing and I'm increasingly becoming a bit like self-aware when I mention this, the culture. The reason I become a bit self-aware because it's very hard to understand inputs in the culture. What is driving culture? Is it the stock price? Like Microsoft stock became 10x in 10 years, in the last 10 years. I think if you give any company 10x in 10 years, the culture is probably will not probably feel bad. I think everything would feel like it's going great. But why is the stock 10x in 10 years? It's because it's culture, the input within that. What's causing what? What comes before? There's a whole book that I recommend to everyone called The Halo Effect. And basically, the thesis is that the same things that people will praise about a company could be the same thing that they're going to complain about, depending on how things are going. When the stock is going well and growth and everything. Well, the CEO is an independent mind. He's a first principle thinker. They have a (laughs) hardcore culture of engineering. But when things are going badly, it's like, oh no, the CEO is a maverick. They're killing their employees at work. That's why they can't hire good talent. And you can fit a narrative to the results that you're seeing. It's basically the same thing we're seeing in the stock market. The price moves and the narrative follows it. And I agree with you. It's very, very hard to know like, what did Nadella actually do? And what is claimed to have been done because things have been going so well. If things start going badly for Microsoft now, would people find all kinds of flaws with Nadella that were there before, but we just never talked about them because there was no reason to? One of the potential concerns that I sensed is I'm not a big fan of their incentive structure. But interestingly, they have three different segments today at Microsoft, like productivity and business processes, intelligent cloud, and more personal computing. What a terrible name, more personal computing, but yeah. (laughs) And all those three segments, 
their profitability increased significantly. And they're like extremely profitable. Like we're not talking about 5%, 10% profitable segment. These are all 30 to 40% operating margin businesses. And then insane. it's growing. What I would highlight is like, if you looked at, if someone didn't give me Microsoft financials, if they just gave me their top line, and if they just gave me their incentive structure, and if you asked me to guess what happened in terms of profitability, I would suspect their margins probably didn't improve much because you're not getting paid for it. They're not being incentivized to focus on their operating margins. If you look at Microsoft's comp, it's mostly based on like revenue, subscriber number, cloud growth, and all that. LinkedIn sessions. sessions. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, I know the stock price. I know their margins and all that. So I can't run the contractual. So, but knowing that, my sense is the culture of profitable growth, the, the deep bias that Microsoft has from the very beginning of the company, even if Bill Gates is not there, even if like, you know, those early employees are not there, even Satya Nadella has been there for forever, for 30 years or something like that at this point. And he's intimately familiar with that culture, with that idea and ethos of profitable growth. And he probably doesn't need to be incentivized. He just thinks about, okay, like, why are you going in this segment? Why are you making this deal? What's the profit going to look like? It's probably a very natural conversation for him and his team, even though they're not directly incentivized. If I were a Microsoft shareholder, that is something I would definitely pay attention to. For example, they're right now going after Google search. They're getting more serious about the search business. Personally, I would think they are actually serious if it appears on their proxy statement. It hasn't so far, but we don't know actually this year's account structure yet. My guess is it will appear. They are doing so much so much of media and press coverage. I would be surprised if it's not there next year. But my guess is it will probably be on like search revenue or market share or something like that. Like it's probably not going to be about profits. But there can be other rationales to try to gain market share in search instead of looking into, obviously they don't want to lose humongous amount of money in search. But let's say if they are generating, let's say, I don't know, they don't report this. Let's say they are generating or 20% operating margin in search. They just make it 0%. It's not a huge business for them. Even if they make 0%, nothing probably changes. It can be a defensive move that has indirect benefits. You distract Google and you make them focus on that part and they attack Office with fewer resources, say. They are taking stakes in some of their customers for Azure who are being exclusive partners with them. This is something that usually is not a great sign. Usually is being the operating word, not necessarily in every case. But again, so far, there is no sign. If you look at their operating margin, it's actually like it is in cloud's operating margin is growing. It's improving year over year. So nothing funky is there. But that's something I would still keep an eye on going forward. And frankly speaking, I'm actually probably even more impressed. The fact that these guys weren't even incentivized to look at profit and they still did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most other companies, that would be just a huge win. Speaking of cloud and Azure, I'm curious how you think about the dynamics in the space with AWS being the leader and the biggest, Azure seeming to catch up to them slowly, but I see that they have some advantages. All of these, basically... Enterprise around the world all have relationships with Microsoft, and so they can use that distribution to give them advantages that AWS may not have or had to build you know, more recently. It's kind of like their distribution advantage generally. We saw that with Teams versus Slack, where Microsoft can plug something in their distribution ecosystem, and it doesn't have to be necessarily as good as the competition, but because it's so much more convenient for the customer that it's all integrated into the rest of what they're already using or they're already subscribing to something and now it's just part of that subscription. And so why should I pay for Zoom if I can do a video call on Teams? We're already paying for Office. Why should I pay for Slack? If that kind of benefit, I think there, there's a parallel with Azure where, well, we're already using a bunch of Microsoft products for all kinds of stuff. May as well run our stuff in their cloud. We're already talking to their people, their salespeople. They may have some people inside of our business doing some integration stuff. So may as well figure out how to integrate into Azure. So I'm curious if you think that this is a huge competitive advantage for Microsoft versus AWS. And then the next question is, you mentioned in the deep dive that there's not many new entrants, right? In the space, there's basically Google and AWS fighting it out. 
my question is, do you think there's always going to be a kind of like would-be fourth place that's always going to dump a bunch of money and pressure the profitability for everybody else? Say Oracle decides to spend billions and billions trying to gain market share on cloud. And is that going to pressure the others? Even if Oracle never kind of wins, even if they never overtake Google, they could still screw the profitability for everybody else. Cloud has become such a complex industry. Like, and I remember listening to uh, the AWS episode by the Acquired guys. Excellent one. Yes, great episode. And after two hours, they're like, you know what? I'm not actually sure what cloud is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anymore. Because cloud is basically all of IT now, but hosted somewhere else, right? But it used to be like, oh, I'm going to buy some compute or some storage. And now it's like any software you want, any framework, APIs, any kind of services, and everything is disaggregated into microservice. So complex. It's definitely very complex. So I feel like if it's, in, if it's the entire IT, it is a humongous market. IT expenditure in the world is like, what, four, five yeah, trillion dollars, something like that? Gigantic. And there's a lot of it that we don't see because we see all these public companies report revenues and we forget just how big the, even on-prem is still gigantic. There's all kinds of legacy stuff running everywhere and it's hard to understand how big that is. It would be preposterous to even have a hint of a claim that I have any idea about all the niches, all the different subsectors of this four or five trillion dollar giant. So it is possible to make it a bit more concise. If you think about cloud infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So AWS is like the giant in infrastructure as a service. And my understanding is it would be very difficult, even for Azure, like let alone Oracle or like GCP, to be able to disrupt AWS in a way that would hurt AWS. Because if you have the scale, like it's a scale game, like that's why cloud works. You pull all the demand, you aggregate all the demand, you pull the supply, you have power advantage, like you know the way you source hardware. Then you get to the scale where you build your own hardware, your own chips, and like AWS has been at the forefront of that. It's all about scale. Exactly. I think when it comes to infrastructure and service, whoever has scale will always be ahead. I don't think anyone can catch up, basically. Theoretically, you can. Like, AWS will have to be extraordinarily bad in protecting their business. It's just hard for me to imagine how they are going to lose their ball on infrastructure as a service. But when it comes to platform as a service, what you basically build on top of the infrastructure, that's what Azure dominates. And there is a theory that more profits are in the platform as a service eventually. It's less commoditized. Right. So like if everything moves to cloud today, and and Jesse talks about 10% being in cloud, I don't really necessarily believe that. Let's say it's, I don't know, 25, 30%. Let's say nobody really knows what's the actual breakdown. So let's say 25, 30% of total workloads are in the cloud now. If it eventually becomes like 75, 25, 75% being in the cloud and 25% non-prem for many different reasons. I think once the infrastructure share gets settled, the majority of the profit may come from selling things that are built on top of the infrastructure. And Azure does have like, a lot of people talk about Azure as the pit of lot in the least resistance when it comes to choosing them. You are already using Office products like, in you know, a Word, Excel, PowerPoint as like, you know, subscription cloud services. Yeah, if Microsoft does a good job, you just go click a few more boxes and then your bill is bigger suddenly and you're using more products. It's very easy. That's where I think, I mean, AWS is aware of that. They are building a lot of things, a lot of things on top of their infrastructure. Azure is the market leader today in platform as a service by a considerable margin. And it is possible. I don't think we can rule that out. That can platform as a service pie be bigger in like 15 years, 20 years over time than infrastructure service? I think that's in the realm of the possibility for sure. And if that's the case, then that's Azure's to lose. Azure is already the leader. They can just you know, keep maintaining the momentum there. It's probably very hard even for a cloud specialist to predict where cloud is moving, where the cloud is going, how AI workloads are going to change the dynamic in 10 years. What I really take comfort from is it does seem like, because it's a huge market and AWS is definitely very dominant in infrastructure service. And even if they kind of lose 
in platform as a service or in the past, the infrastructure service market itself will be gigantic. The whole world runs on your infrastructure. That is a gigantic market. If you have a persistent competitive advantage there, the scale advantage there, that will allow you to protect and grow your profit pool. One question would be how linked are infrastructure as a service and platform as a service? Because as you mentioned, I think a lot of companies will multi-cloud in theory, but in practice, they put almost all of their eggs in one basket and then they keep the other almost as a way to negotiate better prices or hedge or something. If you have such a big advantage in infrastructure as a service, does that help? Is that the distribution mechanism for AWS to get more of the platform as a service? And Microsoft, their distribution mechanism is through like their other relationships. And so they're both kind of attacking platform as a service from a different angle. And so if IASS becomes gigantic, this could be a pretty good way for AWS to get a lot of that higher value stuff. Not that I know the answer, but that's a good question. <laughs> it is a great question. And it's not clear that many people have the answers, to be honest. I was just reading this paper by something called Context Consulting, who basically wrote this paper for Ofcom, which is the UK communications regulator. We're basically studying these hyperscalers, AWS, Azure, and GCP, to understand the market power these companies have and whether there is enough competition between them, among them. At one point, I think in the paper, they mentioned, like when they spoke with customers, they don't necessarily think in those terms like infrastructure service, platform as a service. They just need to use the products. So they know when they ask, are you thinking about Azure, about platform as a service, or just for infrastructure as a service, they would give a blank look. I just want my product to work, my servers to load. I don't care what you call them. What is platform? What is infrastructure? Even that can be not clear cut. I think you are definitely right that that is how AWS wants to gain share in the platform as a service segment within cloud. Once you have the infrastructure, like, hey, why do you have to go to Azure for your applications? Like you can use our application. You're already our customer, you're already using our infrastructure. And Azure is on the other hand saying, hey, you are already using our productivity software and all that. Even if you don't use our infrastructure services, why don't you use these other applications that you can use and utilize and build on top of your infrastructure that you are using in your IT environment? It's not crystal clear to me how those debates will be settled. People are also talking about AI workloads where Azure has a material advantage over AWS. Frankly speaking, I'm still learning about that. I'm still getting my feet into those dynamic. I'm not sure I have a very concrete view how much AI workloads is going to be shifted and what percentage of the eventual workload will be more AI driven and how AWS versus Azure are positioned against that trend. It does seem like, again, consensus is AWS is very well positioned when it comes to AI-based workloads. AWS seems to be in the back foot in those. But that's probably today. But do I really know how that's going to shake out like in five years? Probably not. Like I'm still learning about those aspects. That's a good segue, though. I'm curious about how all this AI stuff, this generative AI, these large language models are going to impact Microsoft's business kind of as a whole. Because there's the aspect of, okay, on Azure, there's going to be a bunch of workloads, but there's also all kinds of other ways that they can use their distribution to sell some of that AI, but also use some of that AI in their product. We're seeing it everywhere. Like it started on GitHub with Copilot. And now apparently every Office product is going to have some kind of AI assistant or generative AI thing or AI transcripts or summaries or it's coming to everything. And I'm wondering how big you think this is going to be for Microsoft? Is this going to take Office to a next level? Is it going to change the trajectory? Is it just going to improve the mode, but things kind of stay the same because Office is kind of so dominant that it's hard to gain market share? Is this such a must have that it helps like the ARPU, right? Because you're already using Office, but all these AI things are going to be add-ons. They're not all going to be included in the price. And so now maybe you pay a few bucks more per month or per seat. Ideally, if Microsoft does a good job of like optimizing the workloads and making them very differentiated and not too expensive to run, it could almost all fall down to the bottom line. I don't know. I'm curious if you have any thought about the impact of AI generally on Microsoft's business. Before responding directly to that question, it's related. I just want to point out Although these big tech companies, all these big tech companies are widely followed, people religiously 
follow this company. It's such a big company, such a huge weight to the index. Professional investors have to know them pretty well. But it doesn't change the fact that, historically speaking, market's record has been very underwhelming in figuring out the moat of these five, six businesses, let's say five years up. It's so far, their track record hasn't been great, in my opinion. Microsoft and Apple was trading at 10 times P, even lower than 10 times P at times. And not so long ago, like six, seven years ago, probably a bit more than that. Even almost any random year in the recent past, you could find from top to bottom, the stock could be moving like 50%. The point I'm trying to make is, I have been following some of these businesses for a while, and the more I follow, and the more history I study, the more I remind myself the importance to be humble in how little I may know in how the competitive dynamic will evolve. I'll tell you, whatever you mentioned about AI and all that, those sounded like very positive for Microsoft. And it's true, that's the consensus. I'll tell you, it's probably a different factor where AI may be negative for someone like Microsoft, especially for productivity and software segment, office segment specifically. So if you think about Google Apps, Google Workspace, Google Docs, Google Sheets, and all that, they've been around for a while, 10 years, more than 10 years. And they don't change very much. <laughs> they don't change very much. It's simple. It's incredibly popular among consumers, but it hasn't really gained a significant foothold in the business segment, in the enterprise segment. They don't disclose it exactly how much revenue they're making because they're just embedded like within Google Cloud. Who knows what's that contribution for Google Workspace? I think Gartner mentioned almost like three, four years ago, they had like 10% market share in the productivity software space. And they're gaining like one to 2%. It's not accelerating, like it's just some, but they are gaining share. And one of the reasons that it's they're not really taking the world by storm by gaining share from Microsoft is the simplicity. The functionalities are not rich in nature, especially compared to Microsoft's Office Suite. I read a very interesting piece. It's written actually almost five years ago by, I think, a guy named Terry Crowley, who is a former Microsoft employee. He was working at R&D in Office, Microsoft Office segment. It's a very well-written piece. He basically explained this Google Workspace versus Microsoft Office competition. And he had a kind of, you know, front row, how they thought about it. They knew that, that Google was coming. They knew Google was trying to compete against them. So how they kind of take the decision, why they decided not to pursue something. So one of the things he talks about, like the idea of the essential complexity and accidental complexity. If you have a Office product like Microsoft Word to build something, to build like a collaborative, like online subscription-based product, the complexity that you have to entail, not only it's super expensive, but it also is just very difficult to do. It's just extremely cumbersome to pull off. And you know, the coding is very difficult. So many features to support, so many legacy so things. So many features, which interact with each other. The features interact with each other, right? So the complexity is just mind-boggling. Now, my concern is, and this is probably optimism for Google and could be concerned because whoever has the large market share, they are worried about protecting it. They are worried about losing it. It's probably the same with Google search. If AI becomes a huge boon for coding complex things, yeah, let's say you're dealing with 10 million lines of codes. If you have to build something on top of it, like all the features that can interact with each other, that the complexity will just be exponential in nature and you just can't deal. Like humans are not good at dealing with those sort of things. But what if AI becomes so good at coding and all that stuff that they may be able to deal with incredible complexity when it comes to coding and the feature-rich interactions that can happen in a, applications like Google Workspace? That's a separate conversation that will not necessarily just affect the moat and viability and profitability for Microsoft Office, but that will probably be potentially a threat for any software, basically. If your moat is just distribution, if your just moat is you have network effects and other forms of competitive advantage, you'll probably be okay and fine. But if your moat is just like, you know, it's just complex product to build, 
I think that can be a challenge. Google Workspace is already extremely popular among young demographics, like because they have, I don't know, 60, 70% market share in K-12. Like people are starting their life with basically Google Workspace app, like not like the Google Docs and Google Sheet and all that, like they're not necessarily paying for it. So they're free. So they're, Google is not necessarily making money from this customer. They're probably taking money away from Office because people are using it instead of Office in many cases. Yes. But in many cases, this, this users are not necessarily converting to be a paying Google Workspace customer eventually because of that lack of rich functionality that you have in Excel. I have used Google Sheet and Microsoft Excel. It's not even a comparison. Like I'm never going to use Google Sheet before by models or like, you know, any, anything that's complex. What if it's possible? What if the rich functionalities that Google wasn't able to kind of incorporate because of the complexity that entails in that web-based environment, browser-based environment, maybe some of those complexities will be proved facile thanks to whatever revolutions AI-assisted coding tools will usher in the next few years. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think it also begs the question, what are the reasons why Google is not being attacking Microsoft and Office more? Is it because it's harder or because they kind of don't care about that segment? It's definitely not that they don't care about the segment. So in that piece, Terry Crowley mentioned, they knew Google is coming after them. They knew Google is gaining foothold. Microsoft was making the bet. They will never be able to, or not never, like they, it will be extremely hard. It's going to be improbable for Google to cross the Rubicon in terms of the moment they try to embed the rich functionality that Office has, then it's not going to be as simple. It's like there's a wall there that it looks like they're not moving, but mostly because they just can't. It's not because they don't want they to. They just can't. Because with lots of Google products, and it seems to be a kind of institutional Google thing that I've noticed, it's like years and years ago, Google had a very special culture and product-centered culture and moving very fast and very different. And as most companies do, when they get very, very big and you have a lot to defend and you're very, very profitable and some segments are very, very profitable and others aren't, so they kind of get forgotten on the side, you start to moving much more slowly, you become more bureaucratic. And so from the outside, sometimes looking at some of Google products, I'm like, okay, has anyone touched Gmail in 10 years? Has anyone touched Google Docs in 10 years? Is anyone still working on the music or instant messaging products, right? That they have five off and then they kill a few and then they create some more and then they kill a few. From the outside, sometimes it can look like that. But I know it's usually more complex than that. On the inside, there's all kinds of reasons and incentives why it may, may not happen. It's interesting to think if AI tools could change some of those constraints and those incentives. That's a very, very good point. It's funny because I feel like apart from Apple, I haven't really studied NVIDIA and Tesla, so I don't have an opinion about their products yet. But apart from Apple, I think when you look at Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, I see a lot of people complaining about their products. Like, you know, oh, Microsoft products, Teams, for example, it's inferior to Slack, like it's not the best product. And that's probably true for many other Microsoft products. Facebook, who uses Facebook? Like it's boomers, it's crapshoot. The Google products are also like a lot of complaints. Like Amazon, like how can a company that generates like half a trillion dollar of revenue has such a poor UX or like website. I see a lot of people complain about that. I think there's some truth to that, but also I think I listened a podcast once where I don't remember who is this person, but he mentioned something like the anytime people just want to talk about UX or like in a user interface in general, it's probably a good sign there is no more innovation left there. The moment you just optimize for UX, like how you can improve this blue line or whatever. That means there is no more innovation there. You're just optimizing for irrelevant stuff to kind of capture more value. Look at Amazon. Yeah, it's not a great website. I agree. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing website that I have seen. It's not. The fact that it still works, not only works, but also it's definitely, like I said, in half a trillion dollar of revenue, not from only a retail, but in retail itself is probably a massive amount. It's because the job is so difficult. The product itself is so difficult to pull off that you don't even need those aesthetically pleasing UX for the product. Or even like think about Facebook, having 3 billion people, or I think for Facebook, I think it's probably, I don't know, two or 3 billion, I forgot. 
probably three. Having three billion people in a single environment, it probably does create complexities that people like you and me just don't appreciate enough. Obviously, we, from our armchair critics, see it. We always think, why is my notification not working? Why is this not working and that not working? In that sense, I guess I do credit Apple. I think people generally agree it's aesthetically very pleasing. They do seem to not only care, but also they have protected quality, improved quality over time. The DNA of the companies are very different. Personally, I tend to think that the main products of most of these get a lot of attention, right? So I don't have too much to complain about the, the, the main Amazon website or Facebook, or I think these things get a lot. It's more like the other things around them. The Kindle could be so much better, but the Fire tablets are terrible compared to an iPad. They feel like five years behind. And there's all kinds of bugs that you feel like if any of the engineers working on this were using it, they would see it right away because it jumps in your face like, this is buggy, this is janky, this could be much smoother, but they just don't care about that kind of stuff. And it's not only about the aesthetics, but the way it works. Things that get slower over time and you have to reboot, right? It's like, what is it, 1995? Or anyway, like Gmail, as someone who is a lot in email, right? And newsletters, Gmail could be made so much better for the users, but okay, it's kind of like good enough and we're not going to touch it. And I know it doesn't really matter to these companies. Right? They could take all of my suggestions there and it wouldn't really change the bottom line. That's probably why they don't care that much. But as a user of the thing, I kind of like the idea that the people working on it are also users of the things and they will notice the problems and they will keep polishing it up and making it better just for its own sake, even if it's not going to make 5% more profit next quarter or something. But it's probably not how the world works at giant companies with 100,000 employees. Obviously, all these companies are so big. Sometimes I wonder, what is the median Meta employee or Google employee or Amazon employee is like? I'm pretty sure this is not an accident. These companies are run so well and so profitable. Like Obviously, there are people who deeply care about the products, the customers, the users. That is why they are profitable. Like in capitalism, the musician is not so kind that you can not care about your customers and you would still make so much money and all that. But obviously, these companies have become so big today, these days. It does make me wonder, does the median meta employee deeply care about connecting the world? Does the median employee at Google care about building something that is basically answering every single question that anyone can ever have? If I worked for this company, I'd be extremely proud of those things. Like I work for a company Let's say if I worked at Meta, like I worked for a company that is connecting the world. That is incredible. But I don't know, like, you know, sometimes you see some forum, like people are just talking about money, which is important, obviously. Incentives drive people. That's totally fine. This company, all they pay well. So it's not like we're asking people to compromise with financial incentives. But again, I don't have an answer to it. I don't know. I don't, how would you know what the median people is like in these companies? That's what the culture is about, I feel like. Zuckerberg needs to focus on maybe that is something he can drive home that what exactly are they trying to accomplish? It's not just in you know, the next month salary. Like, yes, there are always going to be people like that. But you need enough employees to deeply, not only internalize, but also truly buy what exactly they are trying to achieve here. It's not just the next quarter stock price. So those things are important. Where Meta's stock price will be in five years, 10 years, will have a huge bearing on what they're going to accomplish in 10, 20 years from now. Like those things will be relevant. You cannot just you know, ignore these things. But at the end of the day, if well, whoever, let's say Zuckerberg leaves and someone new comes along and they just want the stock price to go higher and let's shut down reality labs, yes, that's the stock price will probably be higher when that happens. But people, if the employees at Meta forgets or are not into the true essence of what exactly they are doing, what they are trying to achieve. If that is not there, it's not going to be there for everyone. These are 70,000 employees organization. There have to be critical number of employees who definitely need to deeply care about those things. Otherwise, I don't think any businesses will be able to survive if people do not truly care about what they are doing. It's not just monthly salary and the next quarter stock price. I think that's the challenge with any company that becomes big. When you're small and you're starting out and the founders can like hire everybody and look them in the eyes and get to know them. And as, you can have a bunch of missionaries. 
And then you scale and you scale. And at some point, the middle managers are hiring people and you can't know everybody. And it's like you get mostly mercenaries because at first you don't have a track record. You don't know if it's going to work out. And so you need someone who believes in you and the vision and is kind of part of your little tribe of crazy people doing this thing. When you're big and successful, you become the place where the people who did well in school are their lives and went to the right things and had the right grades. And they go over there to be successful because they know it's already successful and they can have a career and make money. And that's a very different motivation to go there. And also from the inside, bureaucracy is a real thing. I feel like if I could speak individually to anyone working on Gmail or Office or whatever, they all want to do a good job. And maybe not all, but like most of them but they probably can't because to do anything, you have like 15 meetings and it takes 10 months and you just feel discouraged because it probably takes so much effort to change a comma somewhere in the docs of Office or Excel or something. Under Balmer, I think that was a big problem that Nadella helped solve is that Microsoft always had tons of talent, tons of great engineers. They had these research labs. They did demos of crazy things. I remember demos in like 2005 about all kinds of VR photo stitching stuff and it was great and they never shipped anything none of it ever turned into a product <laughs> and so there can be all kinds of cultures that lead to certain types of things and it's kind of a systemic problem so you could talk to every single engineer and they all want the same thing they all want to do a good job but at the end of the machine the output is like Blah, we're not moving forward. The products are not getting iterating very much and so that's probably one of the special things about Apple is that they've always been about this culture of real artist ship. You have to ship the product. It has to go in the customer's hands. It has to be as good as possible at that moment. And then the next one, we try to make even better. And we never stop year after year after year. And that's why they're so hard to catch up with. And most other companies, like Apple never had a pure R&D culture where there's a bunch of people in a lab in a corner trying to make technologies just for the sake of it. Research is always about a product or a feature or to serve certain purpose. And I feel like a lot of these companies, including Microsoft and Google for a long time, kind of got lost into the, we're going to be the next Bell Labs. And then they just thought up tons of cool stuff. But if it never comes out, it doesn't help the world very much. I bet bureaucracy is a much bigger obstacle than, let's say, employees not wanting to do a good job. I know a lot of people personally who work at some of these companies. These are some of the best people that I interacted with and Same. common friends. We have common friends. and <laughs> Exactly. These are very brilliant people. Many of them are smarter than I am. I think it's unlikely that they don't want to do a good job, but it's just a part of the machine that you say. The bureaucracy is definitely a killer. And that's what you hear from ex-employees there too, right? A lot of time it's like, I left because it wasn't like it was 10 years ago. I couldn't do anything anymore. Or the person I like to work with left and now my new middle manager or whatever is can't get anything done or you kind of hear the stories and I think it's the default state of big companies and anything that isn't that is kind of exceptional. I do think like that is probably increasingly the role of CEO for some of these big tech companies. You are not really building product on a day-to-day -day basis. You are basically there to shape the culture and make sure the company functions as smoothly as possible. Like, yes, these companies have billions of users in their products. If they do something untoward, there will be implication, there will be repercussions for mistakes. And you want to minimize that. You want to make sure that the ripple effects are minimal in nature. But at the same time, it's a difficult dance at times. In some sense, Apple ships hardware products. So obviously they are also big in software. A lot of the value is software, but it's yeah integration. Right, I think Facebook or Google I don't know if their algorithm shipped in the box every year, right? It would be a forcing function, forcing them to like get it super polished and ready for that release. Yes, yes. So that's the role for Sundar Pichai, Mark Zuckerberg, Satya Nadella, Tim Cook, everyone, you know, Andy Jassy. It is a huge problem. I'm pretty sure how to make these companies functional. Like in 70, 80,000 people, it's unheard of almost for technology companies. With all the huge hiring in the past few years and then the huge layoffs recently, well, not huge compared to the total, but huge absolute numbers, we may have seen some of the like mythical man month Parkinson's law type of thing where they kind of got carried away with like more is better and let's nab all of these engineers before the competition gets them because they are sure to do something great with them. 
it's almost like they were stockpiling talent. And we discussed this in the past podcast, but almost like stockpiling talent so that small SaaS software companies couldn't get them. Nobody could hire anyone. Like at the end, <laughs> at this advantage because they were over in Europe. But here, engineers became so expensive, it was almost like a defensive move. But there's a huge cost to the coordination of all these people. And sometimes the more people you add, the slower things go. And you have to onboard all these people. It takes a while. At first, if you're super selective about talent, you can have only the A team. But if you hire tens and tens and tens of thousands of people all the time, the average has to kind of go down over time. It may be super smart people anyway, but they may not be as able to be as selective for all kinds of other criteria. Being smart is not the end all of everything. You need other characteristics to be effective. I feel maybe by cutting a lot of middle management and by trying to downsize some things, maybe it'll help actually go faster on certain things rather than slower. I definitely believe the companies who didn't do layoff in the last six to nine months or will not do in the next few months probably deserve a raise <laughs> because they probably didn't hire it like crazy. They were right. Obviously, many of the CEOs are talk- saying that they are taking responsibility, not in the real sense, what exactly it means to take responsibility. I think, for example, for Meta, like 20,000 people is a lot. Like in 2017, Meta had like 25,000 employees. So literally, basically, what they laid off was their total number of employees in 2017. Zuckerberg should reflect on that. Shareholders like me are obviously, we do think it was required. As he mentioned, it was probably lowering the productivity. But at the same time, although it was probably required to lay off so many people, he should definitely reflect how he got there in the first place. I think Apple didn't do layoffs or minimal. Very I don't minimal. remember seeing Microsoft's in there. Microsoft also did, but probably not super significant. They did some layoff. That's almost surprising because of their very focus on like the profitable growth and being very careful now. But even them over hired in these recent years. Even for like, you know, let's say Google and Meta, their profit margins improved if you end the comparison in 2021. Because there was such a big bump too from the pandemic that they got the budget of leverage from that. So all of these companies, I don't actually remember, I haven't seen Apple's numbers, but like Amazon, Google, Meta, even Microsoft, I think almost everyone in tech, except a handful of companies got fooled by 2021, including investors like us. It did seem like everything had changed, right? The future has been pulled exactly. forward by five or 10 years and this and that. And it kind of seemed to make sense at the time. But I guess it's always like that. If it didn't seem to make sense, it wouldn't be the bubble. Yeah, I mean, Google Meta's top line grew like some crazy percentage in 2021. And if you thought, oh, we're going to grow at 20% next year, let's say. Like you grow, at, I don't know, 30, 40% or whatever in 2021. And like, okay, maybe, yes. So here's the thing, even for investors like us, it's not like we assume there will be another 40% year next year. No, we did assume deceleration. We didn't but assume back to the complete past hard. trend line, right? <laughs> past trend line. Exactly. That's been true for Amazon, Meta, and Google. They all got fooled by the data that they were saying. Amazon basically doubled its logistics network in 18 months. The network that took them like, I don't know, 20-something years to build prior. That's insane when you think <laughs> about it. And it's all not lost. They still got it. They're going to grow into it and optimize. And all these companies, as much as investors are looking at the short term and like, crazy damn, they got fooled. and everything. It's like, well, their competitive position may be still better than it would have been without any of that at all. But in the short term, it's definitely a shock to the system. I think... We're ready for closing words. Any last words on Microsoft? I know we've made lots of parallels to other big tech and to Facebook. I'm, I'm going to mention that in the show notes so people see it coming. But I'm curious if you have any parting remarks after doing this deep dive. How do you feel now about Microsoft versus how did you feel about them before? I, I'm curious, how did it kind of change your view of the company or any other thing we didn't mention? Yeah, I definitely felt I should have studied Microsoft closely probably a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think my closing words would be Again, a reminder that if you are studying big tech, if you are following big tech as an analyst, as an investor, do not underestimate how challenging it can still be to predict how the competitive dynamic will evolve. I think right now, it's probably the most challenging it has been for last, I would say, four or five years because of AI, because of new different vector competition that 
definitely feels like big techers, they're kind of, you know, heading, but feels like they are competing directly against each other more and more. They used to be kind of like each in their own lane, and now they're overlapping a lot more. Each in their own lane, exactly. So we don't quite know what that's like, two companies with such might and resources face off against each other. Even like, for example, people talk about Samsung choosing Bing for their search default, or even like Apple may want to have a conversation with Google <laughs> in the negotiation table. Google wasn't really cornered for a while. People talk about Facebook all the time, how they kind of navigated the shift from desktop to mobile. Google had to do the same. It wasn't obvious that just because you were the search engine in desktop, like you will be the one leading in mobile as well. Oh, for a while, everybody thought everybody would ask questions to their voice assistants or the Apple Watch would be the thing or this or every few years, everybody thinks there's going to be a huge paradigm change, but it does not always happen. So Google hasn't been cornered for a while, for at least like so four or five years now. And if they are truly cornered, it's my personal opinion that some investors seem to begin be angry at Sundar Pichai. I see their point, but I also think almost anyone would have very hard time managing Google over the last few years. If you are growing like they were growing, if you are making money like they were making, and you are a monopoly, it's hard to manage a company like that. In the sense, like, you know, it's hard to keep the culture. And it's hard to stay lean and stay hungry and stay like fighting shape, right? Exactly. Yeah, some people may be rolling their eyes. Yeah, sure, it's hard to run <laughs> Yeah, terrible problem to be so profitable. <laughs> terrible problem. Your strength is your weakness a lot of the time. Yes, exactly. So it was almost inevitable, I feel like. And you have two founders who are kind of laid back at this point in your life. In that sense, it's a bit surprised that even Zuckerberg failed for the same thing. His company also became a lot more inefficient and all that. That's probably an indication. If a founder-led company basically made the same mistake, it feels almost inevitable that a company like Google will make similar mistake. Just as an aside, I once wrote something about how Amazon did this mistake, but from the point of view of Amazon, at the time when you're making decisions in 2020, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so if you overinvest and then it turns out that the future hasn't been pulled forward and whatever, right? it's not a new normal, then you look like you overinvested and you're less profitable for a while, you may need to cut. But if you underinvest and you're wrong and actually things are very different and you may lose a lot more than whatever you lost by overinvesting. Lost opportunity there could be even bigger. So many of these companies may have made rational bets that weren't accurate, but it was the least bad option that they had while in the fog of war. Definitely was a bit asymmetric in terms of the payoff. What if you underinvest and it turns out the world has indeed changed. And your competitors gain and you can't supply your customers for a while and you're out of stock on everything or you don't have enough cloud capacity or whatever it is. That would be bad too. The point I was making with Google was, what if Google is cornered, Samsung is actually serious, and not only Samsung, but all the other niche hardware manufacturers Yeah, also. the dominoes fall. Yes. If that happens, yeah, Google is cornered. Obviously, people still want to use Google, and they may change default in some ways. Who knows what's going to happen in those cases? We don't have actual data points to play that counterfactual. My guess is if it really comes down to that, Google will basically go all out for mobile market. Like Pixel will... They'll give them away. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. All those players, the Samsungs, the other smaller players in the hardware market will face competition from Google in a way they never probably imagined. They should be careful what they're wishing for. If they lose Google in their defaults, are like you can imagine Google is going to be exceptionally serious about their mobile market. Not like all these companies have no moves. It's not like... <laughs> they don't have resources. or That's the thing I always kind of wonder. I feel like I see this on Twitter very regularly. People just declare death for Facebook, for Google, for whatever. I feel like they either have not carefully studied these companies or they deeply underestimate what is ex ex actually the, why they have reached where they are. Is it just by accident? If it comes down to that, that's basically what was my closing thoughts. We don't quite know how the competitive dynamics will change. We may think, yes, sure, Apple will just change their defaults or Apple will just try to increase their share. Do you think Google doesn't know that, doesn't understand that? They have $100 billion cash sitting in their balance sheet. 
you think they are completely bereft of ideas and moves. Now, doesn't mean they will be successful, but they will definitely go off it. They're just sitting idle, mostly at this point. Competitive temperature is going to rise if all these companies are trying to hit each other's core businesses, because they've been mostly competing at the edges. But now when the cores get attacked... And how those wires will be settled, and to what extent who's going to lose, who's going to win, I personally think it's not easy to predict. And the one final thing, I do feel 10 years, 15 years from now, it feels unlikely to me there will be five companies with like similar sort of market cap. I think right now it's not actually not the case. I think Apple and Microsoft have like two trillion. Then you have like one trillion for Amazon and Google. And then you have Facebook, NVIDIA, and Meta, NVIDIA, and Tesla with like 500, 600 billion dollar market cap. I wonder there will be one big winner. Right, the power law for the big tech. Instead of two, is yes. One is like doubled in the next one. So it's instead of like one $2 trillion company, one will be $8 trillion company in like 2030, 2035. And the next one will be $4 trillion. Then that one after that is like $1 trillion. These are kind of insane numbers to think about. But I remember when the $100 billion seemed gigantic, we get used to them. Exactly. So I think the signs are there for that to happen. Because what needs to happen? For someone needs to be $8 trillion, now that needs the next one to be $4 trillion. Someone needs to win big in someone else's market. Like, for example, if Bing becomes like a thing, <laughs> Bing becomes 90% market share in search, then yes, they will take a significant market cap with that. That is a possibility. I don't pretend to know who's going to be that $8 trillion company. My guess is it's not going to be so peaceful. Five, six different companies all living <laughs> with each it's other. It's a lot of the jungle right? out there. Well, my friend, I could talk to you all day, but I think we're going to call this a show. <laughs> Let the listener think about which one is going to be at the top of the power law. It may not be the one we expect. That's the fun part of this game. Yeah, exactly. Seven to 10 years ago, if I appeared on your show, which wasn't there <laughs> back then, and I had told you, you know what? Apple and Microsoft will be two trillion dollar company. I don't think it would sound likely. Crazy. I'd sound crazy. Yes. So yeah, if you think it's crazy... It does feel, it seems crazier to think there will be two $8 trillion companies. I mean, it's possible. Intuitively, that feels right, but we'll see, right? We never know. Intuitively, it feels right that there probably shouldn't be two $8 trillion companies in 10 years. If there is one, first of all, there may be none. Maybe all of but them are lower than today. You never know. Who knows? Yeah, Lina Khan may just come after <laughs> every one of them and just break it apart. So yeah, that is a possibility. But I feel like if all big ticks are intact, 10 years from now, I find it exceptionally unlikely that there will be two $8 trillion companies. It's probably one, and the next is probably maybe four or five, who knows, or maybe even lower. It's a fun thing. We can bet on them by buying their stocks and seeing who's right and who's wrong. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.